Life and death are, of course, the great questions that keep theology and philosophy running. They're posed in many ways, but Connor poses them in a rather strange way, and that's what I want to discuss with him today. You pose the question, is the life before death? Yeah, and I, I do so not to be wacky, but it's a very, very, in fact, the probably most serious question, because awfully, off the time, religious people will go, and philosophers speaking to religious people will go, is there life after death? Mm. You know, is there resurrection? Is there a soul? Is, it is there immortality? Is there immortality? And then they argue, and some theologians will say, uh, some philosophers will go, oh, there might be. And most religious people, theologians will go, well, there is. And then they'll argue over which form that might take. Is it or how you might prove it one how way you or might the other. How you might prove it and, and which form it might take. Is it a soul that's immediately gone to immortality, eternity or whatever? Mm. Is it having to wait bodily resurrection? And that's a very old debate. But for me, there's a massive elephant in the room. And, it's, and I think that both sides are getting it wrong. But recent philosophy and recent science is helping us to rearrange uh, the debate, reconfigure it. And the reason I say is a life or death is that what's very useful for theology, what's a real rain check, what's a real double espresso, is that there's a great deal of philosophy which is now being less trendy and all that left bank Parisian stuff, uh, where it's saying something really quite peculiar. Although we're going to see that it's even there in the Gospels, where they say, listen, we don't exist. There is no such thing as life. This is really wonderful nihilism because it's honest. You'll have uh, philosophers of biology such as Alex Rosenberg from Duke who just brought out a book on the guide to atheism or something. And he has his own little decalogue. He asks the student or whatever, is there free will? No. Is there morality? No. Is there such a thing as love? No. Do you really exist? No. So really, the debate has become a proper one. Because, and science quite often says the same. Uh, Thomas Metzing, in a famous philosopher of mine, said, there is no such thing as a self that never has been, there never was one. Michael Ruse, another philo uh, philosopher of science, says, ethics is an illusion. So, if that's the case, we're really in a, in a bit of a pickle. So the notion of is there a life, the question is a life after death, something of a side debate. Really for the theologian and the more profound philosopher is to be able to argue there is actually life before death. And then if there is, does it some sense entail the possibility of life after death? I mean, Samuel Beckett, one of my favorite writers, once, once wrote that we are born astride a grave, but that's passé. We're born in a grave. There just seems to be a little bit of twitching. And we might call that life, we might, we may not. So what we have now is reductive materialism, which in some sense, some would argue, throws the baby bathwater and the blooming bath over the fence. We are left in the abyss. The abyss is not the coffin. It is not the grave. The abyss is our everyday life. Because the implications are enormous. You can't turn around ethically and go, oh, I think that rape, genocide, paedophilia, holocaust, a car crash, disease, any of these things are in any way significant. You can't even point to them. They don't exist. Because if we're merely material, we're merely material aggregations. We don't actually exist as substantive, robust, real things. We're not real. A car crash is not real. We are, it's a fiction in our heads. It's a social construct. And that means you have to say the Holocaust is no big deal. And that's a really big debate because as a theologian, I think the Holocaust is, well, 
the Holocaust. And I think there is evil. And I think that rape is bad. And I think that, I mean, if this is the case, surely then the courtroom, prisons, so forth, they're simply old-fashioned cultural artifacts from a time when we were childish. But now we should put away childish things and face up to the reality that we've only imprisoned these people because they're inconvenient, culturally speaking. Because what they've done in another culture might be perfectly acceptable. We even see this debate over female uh, mutilation. Some are saying that's a cultural. Jermaine Greer even said it recently. Well, it's a cultural thing. We're being all colonial, being against it. But we guardianistas, we have the liberals, we're going, well, that's naughty. How dare we do that to women? Well, let's be honest. How, on, on what are you basing it? What are you basing your courts on? What are you basing your sense of justice? Yeah? When the Twin Towers fell, we go in horror. When we look at that plane crash the other day, we look at any disaster, we look at someone with cancer, it, I would argue that no one, no one who does not believe in transcendence can actually speak of cancer. Now, what I mean by that is you would need an ontology of oncology, i.e. to say cancer, bad, lack of cancer, good. Because the suffrage, this is universal suffrage, you're really being nice to everyone now. Cancer gets the vote as much as the healthy body. And you've got to pick your team, chemo versus cancer. And it would be anthropocentric of us, colonial of us, Western and white of us, to argue for chemo, chemo naughty. Because after all, if you think about it, materially, all cancer is doing is stopping cells committing suicide, apoptosis. So we could moralize it that way and think anyone enforcing chemo on cancer is being fascist. This is radical democracy. This is a liquidation of existence, one generated by reductive materialism. At last, at last the debate is real. It's nihilism, nothingness, versus the possibility of actually a structured, rich, intelligible, meaningful world. No more bourgeois pretense. Nietzsche said as much. He, he, he teased the English. Oh, they've got rid of their God. God is dead, but they think they can still keep the morality. No, they can't. This is why it's exciting to do theology. This is why it's exciting to do philosophy. And it actually how these genuine debates, it's not, does God exist or not? And you have that pub conversation where one person goes yes, one person goes no, and they have this big fight. Do we exist? A, 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 a thinker who called uh, Gabriel Marcus just brought a book out saying, the world does not exist. There's a burgeoning growth in an argument philosophically that it'd be better if we all just died. Of course, we can't because we're already dead. And that's why they think we should just be extinguished. This is the real debate. Do we think Hitler was merely a cultural inconvenience or an evil man? Do we think the car crash was unfortunate? Rape was evil? What do we think crime is? What do we think beauty is? Why does a scientist believe in rationality or truth? Surely, wait a minute, why do you like that rather than irrationality or a lack of truth? How do we live our lives at all without utter, utter hypocrisy? And in doing so, being hypocrites, fall back into a bourgeois industry of education rather than actually facing up to these profound questions which are at last revealing themselves. That is where theology has to stand, likewise philosophy. I am always amazed at any nihilist who goes to the bother of publishing a book and going through all the agony that that involves, everything from trying to cope with a blank sheet of paper to producing an index, and then takes it to a publisher to tell everyone else that they don't exist. And then collects the royalties. Ah, yes, that's another point. Collects the royalties. Talking, talking about books, you have argued this in an essay in this book, which you edited. Connor, thank you for coming and exploring the question of life before death. We only think I did. 
I might even be a bit more certain than that, though. Thank you.